what do we think? Should we get started? Yes. Let's do it. So we're very excited to have Ashwini talking about DevOps at Atlassian, right? Or something, what's that? Without the dev part. Awesome. Without the dev part. So please welcome Ashwini. Hello? Yeah, perfect. Hello, everybody. I'm Ashwini. I'm a principal developer here at Atlassian on the Atlassian Access team. I'm here to talk to you about Ops at Atlassian. I think given the fact that I'm a developer, me talking about Ops at Atlassian tells a long story about where Atlassian is at. So, Ops at Atlassian. Uh, where are we? At Atlassian, we follow different patterns and practices for doing ops. We have the site reliability engineers, SREs. We have DevOps we, who are embedded within teams. We have sysadmins, and we, of course, have our service owners. Over the past three or four years, we have kind of experimented with different models and tried to figure out what works the best for us. And we, are, we have realized that having a centralized SRE team is the thing that works for us. What do the SREs do is they kind of figure out what are the guidelines, what are the guardrails that we need to have for different services across products and platform, build tooling around all of those things. The thing to keep in mind is this is something that we have experimented with, and this model works for us. You kind of need to figure out what works the best for you. It's not one size fits all solution. So to give you some context about Atlassian, we are more than 100 teams. We have thousands of services that are running, in, and about 600 of them are core services that you would be interacting with as a, at last in products. We have about two major incidents per day. Don't get scared. Those are not like something that we report externally, but these are the things that we have to tackle internally. And hundreds and sometimes even thousands of changes per day across multiple, multiple products that we have. And we have many, many, many customers. This kind of gives an insight as to why we care about ops so much at Atlassian and why we care about making sure that we have a more streamlined process to handling all our services. What I'm going to do today is kind of shine ops at Atlassian through a prism. There are five things that I'm going to be focusing on. Incidents, launch, run, scale, and monitor. The reason why I've placed it in this order is because this is kind of how we have evolved at Atlassian, starting with our incident management system, going all the way to a place where we have so many monitors and alerting that that's something that we have to start caring about as well about handling. Incidents. How many of you have been involved with incidents? With a quick show of hands? Awesome. So I'm not going to get into the details of problems of handling incidents. I'm just going to get into what we do at Atlassian for handling incidents. So at Atlassian, we have a centralized ops, uh, centralized incident management system that is handled by the SRE team. What they do is first and foremost, they provide training. We, the training is something that everybody at Atlassian can go through. It goes over what is our incident management process? What is our kind of severity of incidents? How we categorize our severity of incidents? What are kind of the things you need to care about when you're handling incidents? The thing is, these trainings are mandatory for anybody who is going on call and going to start handling incidents. The next thing we do is we have a simple Jira service desk workflow to handle all the incidents. We handle all the incidents in a single Jira project so that if you want to track or find out if there are incidents, there's one place to go to. And the workflow that we follow is simple, new, pending, fixing, reviewing. We don't get into a complicated workflow. A lot of companies do that, but we also tried doing some things like that, but we realized that keeping it simple works the best for us. What we do in each of these status is we have a lot of custom fields in Jira that we try to track with. What is the timeline? What is the first response time, when did we mitigate the issue? All of these are tracked as custom fields and captured as a part of individual status. Kind of, uh, if you guys have heard that we released Jira Ops Manager a few weeks ago, our essence of entire incident management is captured in the Jira Ops Manager. 
So the next thing we also do is we make it simple for people to report and track incidents. So we have these simple internal URLs. You can go to go slash incident and report an incident. So all the technical and non-technical people within Atlassian can report incidents. The moment they see an abnormality or something is going weird, maybe we should start raising some uh, things. So that's where you can immediately go and raise incidents. We also want to make sure that people can track the status of an incident because we want to keep everybody informed. So internally, we have the links like go slash status, which takes us to our status page. And you can see what are the systems, what is their status. Externally, for all the Atlassian products, you can track the status at atlassian.status.io. So this helps people be in the loop, make sure that they are reporting and tracking at the same time for all the incidents. Incidents happen. What we need to do is learn from them. That's where we get into the post-incident reviews. Post-incident reviews are tracked as a JIRA ticket at Atlassian. So these are kind of the different things we capture in that ticket. What was the impact? What is the summary of the incident? What was the customer impact? Depending on the service, a tier, say it's a tier zero, tier one service, and how long the incident was running, how many uh, customers were impacted, what percentage of customers were impacted. Depending on that, we'll determine the severity of the incident. And then we also track the timeline. When did we first respond? When did we first mitigate? And who are the people who are involved? And what are the conversations that are happening? So all of that is also taken into account when we get into a post-incident review. The next section captures questions like, what went well? What could have gone better? Where did we get lucky? These questions are reflective questions trying to capture what happened during the incident. And the thing that to notice is that all of these are positive questions. We focus on what happened. We'd never ask questions like who fucked up? What, way? what happened? That's not the essence. We want to get out of that incident, learn and grow from there. And we also don't call our process post-mortem because nobody died. We just want to learn. So we call it post-incident reviews. The more important part here is where did we get lucky? These are areas in which you can have risks in your software. Just an example for the other, from the other week. We deployed something to production and rolled it out to 5% of our customers. And for a few hours, nobody even noticed something was wrong. We just got lucky because one person from the team logged in and saw that something wasn't working. This is when we realized that we were really lucky because somebody manually checked it. What we learned from this is that when you're doing incremental rollouts, you need to make sure you have alerting in place that will track that incremental rollout. Because we were monitoring across the board. Across the board, things were just fine. It was just that 5% of one page somewhere hidden that was going wrong. So made sure that we learned from this and made sure that we knew we were lucky there. The next thing we get into is root cause. This is the 5 why analysis of what happened during the incident. We actually want to get to the root cause. We don't stop at root cause like, hey, somebody forgot a manual step somewhere. That isn't a root cause. That's basically you didn't automate something. And the next thing is actions. So actions are pretty important. We prioritize our actions from high priority action items to low priority action items. These, the high priority action items are the items that we commit to delivering within the next four weeks. These are the action items who are, that are going to ensure that we never ever have the same class of incidents ever again. And low priority action items can be something like, hey, we realized that our database architecture isn't the greatest. We need to do something about that. So that can be a long tail thing that you do. This is all great, capturing all that information, but we need to have somebody who's accountable for delivering on these actions, making sure that we are improving. So for the entire PIR process, we have an approver. These are generally the heads of engineering who say that we own the outcomes from these incidents. I am accountable for making sure that the action items are taken care of. There are times when somebody slips the four week deadline and the CTO is the person who will ping you and ask, hey, why isn't this done yet? So that's the amount of uh, seriousness with which we own the outcomes for those actions. And 
The other thing that we are kind of trying out at Atlassian is having a PIR bar raiser. What that means is this is the person alongside the approver who's looking at the PIRs, looking at what is the information we are capturing. These are people who are not involved in the incident, but have done a lot of PIRs to ensure that we are capturing the right summary, the right root cause and actions that will really ensure that we are not doing the same thing again. So it's always good to have that outsider's view to an incident and seeing what's going on. So that's the entire thing about PIRs and how we do that. Next thing is incident values. So we are doing incident management across different products at Atlassian. And what we realized was there are different things we cared about when it came to incident management. Some teams were valuing one thing over the other. There were different things that they cared about. So the root cause, the action items were slightly different. So about 18 months ago, what we did was we went and spoke to all the ops team and a few of the DevOps team and asked them, hey, when you're handling an incident, what are the things you care about? What are the things that make for a successful incident management? And these are the things that we came up with. Detect. A really good service has enough monitoring and alerting in place to ensure that you are the first person to, you as service owner are the first people to detect that there's a problem. You should have enough alerting and monitoring in place to detect something before it becomes an incident. So always ensure that you have enough things to detect. Respond. Teams own services, not an individual. So if I am the person on call and I realize that there are some things that I don't understand, instead of trying to understand and debug it at that point, escalate, find the people who would know the best and make sure that you're getting out of the incident as soon as possible. It's okay, escalate when required. Recover, shit happens. So our customers don't care. Why are we having an incident? They care about us getting out of that situation as soon as possible. Things, for example, you know why an incident is happening. You know what the fix is, but getting that fix from all the way from dev, staging and prod is gonna take time. But a rollback can be a quick enough thing because for a from a customer's perspective, it doesn't matter. Do the quickest thing possible to get out of that incident. Learn, always blameless. And this is very crucial when it comes to an incident management. Ensure that we have an environment which is psychologically safe for everybody involved in an incident to feel empowered to participate and contribute. This is super critical because otherwise you'll always be under the thing that, hey, am I gonna be blamed for this? Am I gonna get fired for this? No, you're not. Improve. This ties back to the last two points from the PIR action item. Understand the root cause. Have action items enough to ensure that you're not going to repeat the same incident again. Always learn and grow from an incident. So my colleague Patrick Hill has this talk about how Atlassian does DevOps in five easy steps. And this he presented at Summit uh, a few weeks ago, I would highly recommend you guys to go and take a look at this talk because it actually gets into the details of how we do, what are the toolings that we do, and a little more into the, the depth of our incident management process. Next. What are we going to have incidents for if we don't launch anything? So, launch. Just a few years ago, Atlassian was a server-first company. We started our cloud journey and then are moving more and more towards our cloud's offerings, right? So when you are in the mode of having deployment cycle six months down the line, one year down the line, the mindset that you need to build and deploy services is way different when you start deploying to server. If it runs on my laptop, is there's a very high chance it's gonna run on my customer's laptop. But the moment you get a cloud into picture, things are not going to be the same. So 
what you generally have is you have an idea of what you want to build. You have an architecture, you have a design for the things that you want to build. But what you really care about also need is you need to care about capacity modeling. What are the security things that I need to care about? Monitoring, performance testing. There are a bunch of things that start coming into picture. So what we did at Atlassian is, of course, Jira has to come into play. Jira plus automation. What we did is we had realized the things that we care about. We put that into a project, added a checklist. So every time a service wants to get launched, you go through that checklist. You go over what are the things that you have to take care of. What's your disaster recovery plan? If you have any exceptions, if, you don't, if things don't apply to you, you raise an exception through a DACI, and the SREs can take a look at exceptions rather than being there for every single point of the checklist. So now you put the onus of being service launch ready on the service owners so they can self-serve everything. This enables everybody to track the progress. With the Jira burndown chart, you can see over the period of time how every ticket gets resolved and how you're tracking towards your go live plan. The checklist is all good, but it's a balancing act. You, on the one hand, you have no effort, no requirements, but services are not ready. You haven't understood what you need to do to launch a service. And every team is trying to solve the same problems over and over again. On the other side, you have completely centrally managed things where there's a lot of high effort, lots of requirements. There's no scope for innovation. But yes, of course, you're going to have robust services which never launch. So this is where we want to balance our launch checklist. And what we do for that is we ensure that we have enough automation in place for people to go most of the way towards that checklist. What automations do we have? If you build a service on using the platform that Atlassian provides, you out, get out of the box monitoring on Datadog, you get logging on Splunk, you get auto scaling, and a bunch of other things. So most of the things on the checklist are taken care of. There's still a few things that you need to take care of manually, like you have to do your security reviews and all of those things. But it's quite, it's enough and it's good for service owners to kind of say that, yes, we'll do this. It's not an onerous job for them to actually get through the checklist. What we want to do over the period of time as we learn the best practices around uh, launching new services is we want to enhance our launch checklist. But the thing that we also want to ensure is that automation bar keeps moving because we want to keep it simple. We want to make people want to go over this checklist. Now I've launched a service. What do I do to run the service? In the old view, I think Greg did a fantastic job of going over the hybrid model and everything where you have developers who build the code, write the code, and then toss it over to the ops team to actually run the services. This works fantastic because somebody else runs your service and you don't have to care about your service. You build your feature and everything is fine. You just tossed it over. It's not so great if customers are using your service. And if you want to make changes to that service, who's going to add that feature? The ops team or the dev team? And if you don't like writing documentation, as a dev, I hate writing documentation. It's, I even prefer not writing Java docs, but don't tell anybody. But it gets really bad when you have an incident. How do you get out of that incident? So the model that we follow at Atlassian is you build it, you run it. One of my colleagues puts it, you buy it, you run it, because you're buying your instances. What do we need to do to make this model successful? This is kind of the operate what you build model that Greg spoke about, and we call it you build it, you run it. You care about things like, what's my uptime? What's my reliability? What's the monitoring that I have? How many incidents am I having? What is the performance characteristics of my service? How many bucks am I creating? So tra track all of this 
and understand your services, we have a process called as tech ops. With tech ops, what we do, it's a weekly review of the key metrics for running your service. So in a hospital, when, you, when shifts change for on-call, there's a handoff meeting that happens. So when running your service, you are also on call and then every week you rotate through the on call rotation. So tech ops is the means in with which you kind of communicate to the next person, get together and say, hey, this is what I've seen over the last week. These are the kind of trends and metrics. These are the kind of in class of incidents. Maybe you will see the same class of incidents next week. It's the kind of handoff meeting, but it also kind of captures our SLIs, our SLAs, and performance characteristics, everything. Uh, to give you an understanding of what we track in my the services that my team owns. So for example, for the backend services, what we realized is we don't, re, uh, we, what we want to track as our SLIs is the end user experience. So we don't just call the APIs, we actually do the user clicks and have web drivers to make sure that the end-to-end -end user experience is right. We run these tests every minute in production and make sure that all those tests are keep passing because that's what my user is going to experience. The other things that we do for our front end is we also have a um, independent front end. For those front end services, we track how many JavaScript errors are we seeing? What are our page load times? What are our latencies? All of those things are automatically captured in New Relic. We just make sure that we are improving or at least are stable on all those fronts. I mentioned that TechOps is kind of the handoff meeting and getting everybody on the team together to see what happened. It also enables us to have roll-up meetings. So multiple uh, teams uh, tech ops reports roll up to the heads of engineering. They look at what are the metrics, how, what is the health of the services in the organization? What are the next set of investments we need to do to empower all the teams to focus more on the features? What are the things that we are not doing well? Let's have investments enough for services to be able to run their own services. Next, we have scale. This talks more about scale in our operational maturity than scaling your services. We are looking at all these metrics with the tech ops, right? But as we kept looking at these metrics, over the period of time, we realized that there was something off. So we zoomed in a little bit. What we realized was, there we go. Uh, what we realized that for our largest customers, Jiro was not performing as well as we would expect. But our P99s were still fine. But these are our largest customers. So in the big scheme of things, there was a small thing, but we wanted to grow from our 2K user limit to 5K user limit. So we actually had to double down and understand what was happening. To do that, what we started doing is we started having uh, these tech ops kind of uh, review and analysis for certain cohorts of customers, drilling down into what were the things that were pain points for them, understanding what's happening and tracking those metrics at a micro level as well, rather than just at the macro level. What this enabled us to do is we could focus on the customer, look at the numbers and rally all the teams across the board to help those biggest customers. Now we were tracking all of this on a weekly basis and trying to see how we can kind of improve, making sure that that cohort of large customers was really seeing the improvement. And with all of these different teams playing together, we, the crucial part was reporting, making sure that we track all the information, look at the numbers, understand where we are heading, are we blocked? Are we not making any progress? And this also, this report was not just on a Confluence page. It was shared across with everybody at Atlassian so that we could build a customer empathy for what problems are they seeing. As a 
user, maybe I'm sitting on a 4G network, it is fine. But the moment you get on a 3G, what does it look like? What are the kind of things that our customers are experiences? Tracking those, making sure that we actually have a problem and make sure that we are solving that problem every week. Where did we get to with this? We had customer improved customer experience because we really focused on those bigger cohorts. We had improved customer, I'll just say focus first. <laughs> uh, anyway, so with the improved customer focus, we had improved customer empathy. We had an understanding of who our customers were. Every day, the change that I do, I know how exactly it's going to impact the next week's report that is going to get generated. So it, you can feel connected with your customers as well. And regular reporting helped us understand, are we blocked? Are we making progress? And track how we are doing. Monitor. So, we always talk about having enough monitoring in our services, right? So when I build a new service, I'll have some monitoring and dashboard for that service. But a few weeks down the line, I'm going to start talking to other services. I have to start having monitoring and dashboard for those interactions. So as your number of services grow, your number of dashboards and monitoring is going to start uh, exponentially growing. So you have your number of services going up, you have number of monitoring going up. One would think that you would have nailed down how to do monitoring and spend less time on doing monitoring. But probably what's going to happen is you're going to spend more and more time trying to maintain all of those different monitors, dashboards, but you ideally want that time to start going down. So the problem that we were facing was that we had these multiple, multiple dashboards. And say, for example, there was a P99 calculation that we had across the dashboards and we realized, hey, we need to tweak that number because that's not the right way to calculate the P99. How do I update that across those dashboards? What do I do for those things? That's when NSRE is like, have you heard about Terraform and pipelines? How many of you have heard about Terraform? Oh, wow, that's quite a bit of you. Awesome. How many of you have heard about pipelines? Awesome. So just to give you context, Terraform uh, is developed by HashiCorp. And what they enable you to do is have config as code. Now we just kind of merged in the config as code concept with pipelines. And this is what you end up with. So we took all the configuration for our different monitoring and dashboards and put that into a Terraform config. So the moment you want to make a change, all you have to do is edit one config somewhere and create a Bitbucket PR, approve, merge, build, deploy, one click. Up, upgrade to staging. Next click, upgrade to prod. So it kind of made everybody's life simple. You had hundreds and hundreds of dashboards that you have across the board updated with one click. It also enables you to monitor how that change is looking and on staging. If you messed up, you can just roll back that change. As simple as that. No longer do you have to spend tens of hours trying to re-update them back to a different number. So now that we have updated all the dashboards, everything is fantastic. And now we have absolutely nailed everything, right? So we've kind of gone over the five things for in ops at Atlassian. What I do want to call out is what have we learned from all of this? What do we care about? What we at least at Atlassian care about? For incidents. Keep it simple, keep it blameless. Keep it simple for everybody to report and track incidents. Keep it blameless for everybody to participate in a very psychologically safe environment in the incidents. Incidents happen. We need to just get out of them as soon as possible. Launch. Focus on the outcomes. What's our, our goal? We want to make sure that we have robust services. Automation is just a means to that. Don't kind of over-focus and just start automating everything. Understand where you want to go to. Run. Always track your metrics. I think 
a lot of us do a fantastic job of having enough metrics and monitoring all of that. I personally didn't do a fantastic job of tracking how my metrics were doing. We had tons of metrics, but we never looked at them and see, are we doing okay? We were just doing fine every week, so we didn't bother about it. But I think now that we look at it every week, I feel good about the progress we are doing. Kind of the page load times going down and all of those improvements that you do, you actually feel good about the progress, but sometimes, yes, you see the blips, you understand what's happening. So always make sure you go back and track your metrics. Scale, detect the outliers. So with all the metrics that you're tracking, all the things that you're looking at, it's always important to dig deeper into some of those outliers. There can be some anomalies. Don't ignore those anomalies. Zoom in and understand, is that something that we need to care about or is that something that's okay? Because sometimes that can be one request from one customer who is going to just create an incident sometime. Understand what is happening. But monitor. Always ensure that you detect things first. Don't be daunted by the number of dashboards and monitors you're building. There are some things you can do to help you ease into main, maintaining and managing all those dashboards, but ensure that you have, it's okay to over monitor, over detect, that's fine. You'll find your sweet spot some someday, but always make sure that you are the first people to detect what's happening. With that, I'd like to say thank you. Thank you, Ashwini. Any questions about Lassian's operational prowess? Yes. So in the weekly roll-ups, um, identifying outliers and trends, is that, and I think you also mentioned like your heads of engineers. Is any of that analysis, is that automated? Are you running analytics across these metrics? Or So all of these reports, we don't sit and create those Confluence pages. Those are automatically generated by all the monitoring and alerting that we have. So uh, when all I have to do on a Monday morning is if I'm on call, just click on a button somewhere and that page is right there. So it automatically talks to our data dog. It automatically talks to PagerDuty to pull up all the metrics. I get, okay, maybe I misunderstood. I thought, so that's for your service. And then let's say there are 50 services and that's all rolling up to somebody who's looking um, across them on a weekly basis to see, hey, maybe, I don't know, our latencies are going down or our performance profile is varying across many of these services. So that's essentially identifying, like in your example, it was your largest customers but it could be some other profile, right? So is that analysis that's figuring out? Is like So what we question. do in these reports is the report is generated by team-wise. So it's not just per service, there can be multiple services. And what we do is we summarize what we are seeing as a part of that report. So I, I click on that one click page, auto page, but I summarize what are the things that we are seeing? What is kind of the outlier? What are we seeing something? And this is the summary that gets rolled up. So the heads of engineering don't have to drill down and understand every metric that's there, but more of the summary of what we are seeing and what we are trending towards. Does that answer your question? I think so. So is that summary automatically generated? No. Okay. No. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much, Ashwini, and thank you, everyone. Thank you, Alassian, for hosting. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Uh, has Just quick show of hands, how many people here, this is our first Productivity Engineering Silicon Valley meetup. Did you show up for the content, content up, or location, where you just had nothing to do tonight? <laughs> That was me. So we, Sagid and I will try to put together another uh, meetup. We've been trying to alternate between San Francisco and then somewhere in the South Bay. So give us feedback. Please reach out to me directly. Grab me afterwards. Tell me how the location was, everything like that. So thank I'm sorry. Oh, yes. And if anyone wants to speak, we love speakers. So come talk to us. All right. Thank you. Thank you.